Hi, I think I'm live. Um, something terrible's happened to my lighting. I don't really know what. Um, I think I might just open the window, the curtain. Is that okay? Yeah, that's pretty good. Turn off my little light and diffuser. I don't think they work. I think it's a beautiful day outside. Actually, no, that's too much because then you can't see. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm trying to do this without, you know, without really understanding light or um, video cameras or microphones or anything. I've got a new microphone going now. Um, I'm hoping that it is coming through this microphone and not, no, nope, it's coming through the normal microphone, <sighs> but it's cool. We've got the, um, well, that's good. Thank you, Julie. Although I, I always think of you as Skelly. Yeah, it's, it's got to be good enough for today. Um, I have got this amazing new microphone, which was a gift for Christmas, and it's great, except um, every time I try and tinker with it, it makes me really mad. So I have to get um, my tech guy <laughs> to come around and, and sort of fix it for me. But anyway, this is the best lighting we're going to have for this video. I'm sorry. We'll try again. Right, two minutes in, I haven't done anything, but today we're starting a new reading, a new long read, and it's a book that I actually haven't revisited since um, over 10 years, I would say, when I was at university doing um, what I thought was going to be a degree in medieval history, but turned out to be nine years of part-time study that ended with nothing <laughs> didn't even quite get a bachelor's but I do remember Marjorie Kemp now she was born yeah exactly it's hard it's really hard um, I'm hoping that we're all going to learn a lot about you know, English medieval society and the role of women and the role of religion and sainthood and I also hope that we're all going to really connect to a woman who is um, bonkers. Uh, yeah, so basically she was born in King's Lynn, which was called Bishop's Lynn at the time. In the 14th century, I have not fact-checked, I'm sorry. Um, late 14th century, so she's kind of, most of this stuff is going on the early 15th century. Um, and yeah, she was a, a middle class girl. This is the first autobiography of a woman in English. Um, but she did have to dictate it to a priest because she couldn't actually read or write. Uh, but she did. And it was partly because, um, to sort of justify her life and the things that she'd done because she got quite a bad reputation. I mean, I wanted to entitle this series Marjorie Kemp, Mental for Jesus. Which, you know, I kind of have the right to use the word mental. Don't have the right to say mental for Jesus because I'm not actually a Christian. But I was raised by one. So, basically Marjorie Kemp got this priest to write down an account of her life and her relationship with God and all the crazy stuff that had happened to her to say, look, I'm basically fuck the haters this is how it actually went down and so you know a book like that's going to be good I think she's called uh, a blessed or the Beata Marjorie Kemp or something which I'm not Catholic but I know it's not sainthood and I think it is because of her middle class um her middle class origins <laughs> oh, shit, sorry I feel like I'm underwater that's cool 
Right, so now that you know the kind of setup of the book, this is Marjorie dictating to a priest to justify her life, and um, also she doesn't, she refers to herself in the third person the whole time, out of humility. Uh, whether that humility is genuine, we will see. So, the book of Marjorie Kemp, which begins at five minutes into this video. We're going to do the proem and the little prologue. The proem. Here begins a short treatise and a comforting one for sinful wretches, in which they may have great solace and comfort for themselves and understand the high and unspeakable mercy of our sovereign saviour, Jesus Christ, whose name be worshipped and magnified without end, who now in our days deigns to exercise his nobility and his goodness to us unworthy ones. All the works of our saviour are for our example and instruction, and what grace he works in any creature is our profit, if lack of charity be not our hindrance. And therefore, by the leave of our merciful Lord Jesus Christ, to the magnifying of his holy name, Jesus, this little treatise shall treat in part of his wonderful works, how mercifully, how benignly, and how charitably he moved and stirred a sinful wretch to his love, who for many years wished and intended through the prompting of the Holy Ghost to follow our Saviour, making great promises of fast, together with many other deeds of penance. And she was always turned back in time of temptation, like the reed, which bows with every wind and is never still unless no wind blows, until the time that our merciful Lord Christ Jesus, having pity and compassion on his handiwork and his creature, turned health into sickness, prosperity into adversity, respectability into reproof, and love into hatred. So, essentially, she's a Jesus stan, thinks he's great. Many people were at the time. Many people still are. Um, but, uh, pretty much her life turned to crap. Thus, with all these things turning upside down, this creature, she calls herself this creature in humility, who for many years had gone astray and always been unstable, was perfectly drawn and stirred to enter the way of high perfection, of which perfect way Christ our Saviour in his own person was the example. Steadfastly he trod it, trod it, and duly he went it once before. Sorry, I'm not quite... I'm not quite... Um. Yeah, it, it's got echoes of uh, like modern... BDSM culture, I believe. Uh, it's just something interesting. I'm not quite, I haven't quite come to grips with this borrowed Kindle. Thank you very much to John for making a great deal of this possible. Uh, then this creature, of whom this treatise, through the mercy of Jesus, shall show in part the life, was touched by the hand of our Lord with great bodily sickness through which she lost her reason for a long time, until our Lord by grace restored her again, as shall be shown more openly later. Basically, she fell into a pretty bad postpartum depression. Uh, her worldly goods, which were plentiful and abundant at that date, were a little while afterwards quite barren and bare. Then was pomp and pride cast down and laid aside. Those who before had respected her afterwards most sharply rebuked her. Her kin and those who had been friends were now her greatest enemies. It is a mood. Haters gonna hate. They're fake friends, the haters, they don't want her to live her best life. Then she, considering this astonishing change and seeking succour beneath the wings of her spiritual mother, Holy Church, went and humbled herself to her confessor, accusing herself of her misdeeds, and afterwards did great bodily penance. And within a short time, our merciful Lord visited this creature with abundant tears of contrition day by day, insomuch that some men said she could weep when she wanted to, and slandered the work of God. Basically, these other haters are saying that Marjorie, crying uncontrollably every time she thinks about Jesus and how wonderful he is, um, yeah, a lot of her haters were like, oh, she can just turn on the waterworks. It's a grift. It's a fake. 
And she's like, fine, I'm going to hire a priest. He's going to write my entire life story and then we'll see. She was so used to being slandered and reproved, to being chided and rebuked by the world for grace and virtue with which she was endued through the strength of the Holy Ghost, that it was to her a kind of solace and comfort when she suffered any distress for the love of God and for the grace that God wrought in her. But ever the more slander and reproof that she suffered, the more she increased in grace and in devotion of holy meditation, of high contemplation, and of wonderful speeches and conversation which our Lord spoke and conveyed to her soul, teaching her how she would be despised for his love, and how she should have patience, setting all her trust, all her love, and all her affection on him alone. She knew and understood many secret things which would happen afterwards, by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And often, while she was kept with such holy speeches and conversations, she would so weep and sob that many men were greatly astonished, for they little knew how at home our Lord was in her soul. Nor could she herself ever tell of the grace that she felt. It was so heavenly, so high above her reason and her bodily wits, and her body so feeble at the time of the presence of grace, that she could never express it with her words as she felt it in her soul. Yeah, exactly. Get him, Marjorie. So she's just, when she becomes overwhelmed with the feeling of God's grace, she starts crying and weeping. And people are dicks about it. They think that um, this blue light is really bugging me. I'm going to shine it right into my face. Which also makes it even bluer, but slightly more illuminated blue. Turning it up, do we? No, that's horrifying. Just have it on the low one there. There we go. Uh, yeah. She's a faker. You know. But, you know, I think that uh, the, the feeling of God's grace within her just being so overwhelming that she can't really explain it to people and the tears that she can't help coming... Kind of reminds me of being on ketamine. Um, not recreationally. I do it therapeutically in a clinic. Which happens to be in a van. It's not in a van. Then this creature had great dread of the delusions and deceptions of her spiritual enemies. She went by the bidding of the Holy Ghost to many worthy clerks. Both archbishops and bishops, doctors of divinity and bachelors as well. She also spoke with many anchorites and told them of her manner of life and such grace as the Holy Ghost of his goodness wrought in her mind and in her soul, as far as her wit would serve her to express it. And those to whom she confided her secrets said she was much bound to love our Lord for the grace that he showed to her and counseled her to follow her promptings and her stirrings and trustingly believe they were of the Holy Ghost and of no evil spirit. So, yeah. A mini van. So an anchorite, if you don't know what it is, it's a um, a religious person uh, in the Middle Ages who would, uh, essentially they would just live in a tiny little cupboard, like an outdoor cupboard, and didn't really see people. You could come around and have a chat to them, but they wouldn't actually come out of their cupboard. You could bring them some cabbages, they wouldn't come out of their cupboard, but then they would eat. They were just meant to be completely alone to think about Jesus. One of the most famous anchorites is Julian of Norwich, who I really hope we can do after this one. Um, if you'll excuse me. I figure it's Marjorie Kemp. Let's do some excess. And uh, bachelors in this sense, obviously... Oh, anchorites are brilliant. They are very interesting. Um, I do. I've got cog. Thank you, Alex. I'm so happy. Um, again, from my uh, incredibly underrated tech, John. Uh, yeah, anchorites are brilliant. Uh, some of them were actually quite social. Like, they were just alone to love God and eat cabbage or whatever. But they would also 
accept visitors and kind of inspire them on spiritual matters or pray for them usually for a fee because that was just how stuff worked in the middle ages it was like therapy is now they charged incredible amounts of money um sorry i got all confused just then not about marjorie camp i know what i'm saying about the uh where i put my coat um all oh right and bachelors obviously in this case it doesn't mean um unweird young men it means you know university bachelors pretty much all right some of these worthy clerics took it on peril of their souls and as they would answer to god that this creature was inspired with the holy ghost and i changed the page because i suck that this creature was inspired with the holy ghost and bade her that she should have a book written of her feelings and her revelations some offered to write her feelings with their own hands and she would in no way consent, for she was commanded in her soul that she should not write so soon. And so it was twenty years and more from the time that this creature first had feelings and revelations, before she had any written. Afterwards, when it pleased our Lord, he commanded and charged that she should have written down her feelings and revelations and her form of living, so that his goodness might be known to all the world. Then the creature had no writer who would fulfil her desire, nor give credence to her feelings until the time that a man living in Germany, who was an Englishman by birth and afterwards married in Germany and had there both a wife and a child, having good knowledge of this creature and of her desire, and moved, I trust, through the Holy Ghost, came to England with his wife and his goods, and dwelt with the said creature until he had written as much as she would tell him in the time that they were together. And afterwards he died. Which is an incredible... <laughs> Which is an incredibly funny bit. It's like, oh, you came around and helped me with my book to the fullest extent of his capabilities, and then dead as a door now. Then there was a priest that this creature had great affection for. And so she talked with him about this matter and brought him the book to read. The book was so ill written that he could make little sense of it. For it was neither good English nor German, nor were the letters shaped or formed as other letters are. Therefore the priest fully believed that nobody would ever be able to read it unless it were by special grace. Nevertheless, he promised her that if he could read it, he would willingly copy it out and write it better. So your first drafts may suck, but they're not going to suck worse than the first draft of the Book of Marjorie Kemp. It's not good English, it's not good German. This is really washing me out. Oh, this creature is feeling vain now. What a terrible creature. I can't believe how much makeup I slapped on for this. Now it's just turning me blue. Exactly. This creature should not be doing vanity online. That's what I do online. Um right okay it gets juicy though then there was such evil talk about this creature and her weeping that the priest out of cowardice dared not speak with her but seldom nor would write as he had promised the said creature and so he avoided and deferred the writing of this book for nearly four years or more notwithstanding that this creature often entreated him about it at last he said to her that he could not read it, and for this reason he would not do it. He would not, he said, put himself in peril over it. So that priest is a fake friend. Massively fake friend. Not a good dude. Uh, then he advised her to go to a good man who had been great friends with him that first wrote the book, supposing that he would best know how to read the book, for he had sometimes read letters written by the other man, sent from overseas while he was in Germany. And so she went to that man, asking him to write this book, and never to reveal it as long as she lived, granting him a great sum of money for his labour. And this good man wrote about a leaf, and yet it was little to the purpose, for he could not get on well with it. The book was so badly set down and written quite without reason. He managed about a page before he gave up. 
obviously it's fine to speak ill of the dead because you were going on and on about how how shitty the initial writer was. <clears throat> then the priest, remember the priest, the fake friend, then the priest was troubled in his conscience for he had promised her to write this book if he could succeed in reading it and he was not doing his part as well as he might have done. And so he asked this creature to get the book back again if she fittingly could. Then she got the book back and brought it to the priest very cheerfully, praying him to work with a good will, and she would pray to God for him and gave him grace to read it and to write it as well. The priest, trusting in her prayers, began to read this book, and it was much easier, he thought, than before. And so he read over every word of it in this creature's presence, she sometimes helping where there were any difficulty. Yeah, it, it's catching on. Um, this book is not written in order, everything after another as it was done, but just as the matter came to this creature's mind when it was to be written down, for it was so long before it was written down that she had forgotten the time and order of when things occurred, and therefore she had nothing written but what she well knew to be indeed the truth. I'm really liking this chaotic system of writing things down according to your heart. When the priest first began to write this book, his eyes failed. There's no end. So that he could not see to form his letters and could not see to mend his pen. All other things he could see well enough. He set a pair of spectacles on his nose, and then it was much worse than it was before. He complained to the creature about his troubles. She said his enemy was envious of his good deed and would hinder him if he might. And she bade him do as well as God would give him grace and not give up. His enemy, in this case, is the devil, not like a proper enemy that can blind you and give you bad spectacles. When he came back to his book again, he could see as well, he thought, as he ever did before, both by daylight and by candlelight. And for this reason, when he had written a choir, he added a leaf to it, and then he wrote this poem to give a fuller account than does the following one, which was written before this. Anno Domini, 1436. Okay, so this is why I wrote the book. Uh, this is how hard it was to get the book written. This is how uh, my priest went a little bit hysterically blind, but then he was fine again after some prayers. And, uh, oh, also, the next bit was written earlier than this bit. I'm Marjorie Camp. Have fun. <laughs> I love it. So the preface was written before. The preface, a short treatise of a creature set in great pomp and pride of the world, who later was drawn to our Lord by great poverty, sickness, shame, and great reproofs in many diverse countries and places, of which tribulation some shall be shown hereafter, not in the order in which they befell, but as the creature could remember them when they were written. For it was twenty years and more from the time when this creature had forsaken the world and busily cleaved to our Lord before this book was written notwithstanding that this creature had much advice to have her tribulations and her feelings written down, and a white friar freely offered to write for her if she wished, and she was warned in her spirit that she should not write so soon, and many years later she was bidden in her spirit to write. Uh, a white friar is just, um, shit, which ones are the white friars? I'm going to get this wrong, I'm going to get mansplained at, but I believe they are the friars of St. Augustine. The white friars? Franciscans are the brown ones. Dominicans? Anyway, it's a it's a it's a brand of friardom. Characterized by wearing white habits. Um monk outfits. Uh, and then it was written first by a man who could neither write English nor German well. Oh, going back to fashion him so that it could not be read except by special grace alone. For there was so much obloquy and slander of this creature that few men would believe her. And so at last a priest was greatly moved to write this treatise, and he could not read it for four years together. And afterwards, at the request of this creature, and compelled by his own conscience, he tried again to read it, and it was much easier than it was before. And so he began to write in the year of our Lord, 1436, on the next day after Mary Magdalene, on the next day after Mary Magdalene, after the information of this creature. 
and the next day after Mary Magdalene pretty much means that um, medieval people rather than uh, you know rather than saying the 6th of May or whatever would say how many days before or after a major saints feast day a thing happened um, not always a saints feast day it could be Christmas <laughs> but you know the the big holidays of the medieval calendar so here it just it just means the day after the feast of Mary Magdalene which I don't know when that is so that actually took less time than I thought so I might begin with book one chapter one right now we still came, still enjoying Marjorie. All right. Book one, chapter one. When this creature was 20 years of age, or somewhat more, she was married to a worshipful Burgess of Lynn, King's Lynn, Bishop's Lynn. Thank you, Skelly. And was with child within a short time, as nature would have it. And after she had conceived, she was troubled with severe attacks of sickness until the child was born. And then, what with the labour pains she had in childbirth and the sickness that had gone before, she'd spared of her life, believing that she might not live. Then she sent for her confessor, for she had a thing on her conscience which she had never revealed before that time in all her life for she was continually hindered by her enemy, the devil, always saying to her that while she was in good health, that she didn't need to confess, but to do penance by herself alone, and all should be forgiven, for God is merciful enough. And therefore this creature often did great penance in fasting on bread and water, and performed other acts of charity with devout prayers, but she would not reveal that one thing in confession. And when she was at any time sick or troubled, the devil said in her mind that she should be damned, for she was not shriven of that fault. Therefore, after her child was born, and not believing she would live, she sent for her confessor, as said before, fully wishing to be shriven of her whole lifetime as near as she could. To be shriven, to, to, have your, to have your sins, you know, forgiven by a priest. Uh, and when she came to the point of saying that thing which she had so long concealed, her confessor was a little too hasty and began sharply to reprove her before she had fully said what she meant, and so she would say no more in spite of anything that he might do. And soon after, because of the dread she had of damnation on the one hand and his sharp reproving of her on the other, this creature went out of her mind and was amazingly disturbed and tormented with spirits for half a year, eight weeks, and odd days. So basically, Audrey had a baby and wanted to confess the worst sin that she'd ever done, but the confessor was kind of a dick about it, so she couldn't, and she got a real bad case of the postpartum depressions over it. Interestingly, we never find out what that sin is from memory um i guess it's none of our business i hope that at some point marjorie was um shriven of this terrible sin we don't know um so yeah for over six months she's got the real bad postpartums not good and in this time she saw I know, he's a bad priest. And I really want to know what this sin is. It sounds fascinating. Anyway, in this time she saw, as she thought, devils opening their mouths all alight with burning flames of fire, as if they would have swallowed her in. Sometimes pouring at her, sometimes, god damn it, threatening her. Oh, don't say god damn it. Sometimes pulling her and hauling her about both night and day during the said time. And also the devils called out to her with great threats and bade her that she should forsake her Christian faith and belief, and deny her God, his mother, and all the saints in heaven, her good works and all good virtues, her father, her mother, and all her friends. And so she did. She slandered her husband, her friends, and her own self. 
She spoke many sharp and reproving words. She recognized no virtue nor goodness. She desired all wickedness, just as the spirits tempted her to say and do. So she said and did. She would have killed herself many a time as they stirred her to, and would have been damned with them in hell. And in witness of this, she bit her own hand so violently that the mark could be seen for the rest of her life. And also she pitilessly tore the skin on her body near her heart with her nails, for she had no other implement. And she would have done something worse, except that she was tied up and forcibly restrained both day and night, so that she could not do as she wanted. So there's a really dark time in Marjorie's life. Obviously, she's um, she's on some pretty intense suicide watch, uh, being given the finest medical treatment of the age, being tied to a bed until it goes away. Um, which actually probably saved her life. I would not have um, I would not have wanted any uh, any of the actual finest medieval medical care of the time for brain demons. Um, I wouldn't have liked it. I don't think Marjorie would have liked it either. But uh, yeah, this is not a good time for Marjorie. And when she had long been troubled by these and many other temptations, so that people thought she should never have escaped from them alive. Then one time, as she lay by herself and her keepers were not with her, our merciful Lord Christ Jesus, ever to be trusted, worship be his name, never forsaking his servant in time of need, appeared to this creature who had forsaken him in the likeness of a man, the most seemly, the most beauteous, and most amiable that ever might be seen with man's eye, clad in a mantle of purple silk, sitting upon her bedside, looking upon her with so blessed a countenance that she was strengthened in all her spirits. And he said to her these words, Daughter, why have you forsaken me, and I never forsook you? And as soon as he had said these words, she saw truly how the air opened as bright as any lightning, and he ascended up into the air, not hastily and quickly, but beautifully and gradually, so that she could clearly behold him in the air until it closed up again. And presently the creature grew as calm in her wits and her reason as she ever was before, and asked her husband, as soon as he came to her, if she could have the keys of the buttery to get her food and drink as she had done before. Her maids and her keepers advised him that he should not deliver up any keys to her, for they said that she would only give away such goods as there were, because she did not know what she was saying, as they believed. Nevertheless, her husband who always had tenderness and compassion for her, ordered that they should give her the keys. And she took food and drink as her bodily strength would allow her, and she once again recognised her friends and her household, and everybody else who came to her in order to see how our Lord Jesus Christ had worked his grace in her. Blessed may he be, who was ever near in tribulation. When people think he is far away from them, he is very near through his grace. Afterwards, this creature performed all her responsibilities wisely and soberly enough, except that she did not truly know our Lord's power to draw us to him. So that was chapter one. Um, I'm going to put content warnings on this, I guess. Uh, when Marjorie goes through, has her first kid, real bad postpartum depression, vision of Jesus, feeling better, which is lovely. And also, only six months, amateur hour. Yeah, pretty intense. Um, Marjorie is a very intense person. Um, I think I might, I think I might carry on with chapter two while we're here. Um, <clears throat> chapter two. And when this creature had thus through grace come again to her right mind, she thought she was bound to God and that she would be his servant. Nevertheless, she would not leave her pride or her showy manner of dressing, which she had previously been used to, either for her husband or for any other person's advice. And yet she knew full well that people made many adverse comments about her, because she wore gold pipes on her head and her hoods with the tippets were fashionably slashed. Her cloaks were also modishly slashed and underlaid with various colours between the slashes, so that she would be all the more stared at and all the more esteemed. 
a little bit to unpack there. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so you know how you know how on the sleeves of princess dresses sometimes they got a big sleeve with cuts in it, and then you can see other colors coming through. That's the kind of thing. Marjorie's super into fashion, and um, yeah, yeah, her husband really seems to listen to her. And believe her when she says that she's feeling better, which is really nice, actually. Um, gold pipes on her head. Um, could mean a lot of different things. Uh, hoods with the tippets. I mean, look, it's it's fifteen. You know, it's early fifteenth century clothing for the middle class. And she is dressing as fine as she can because um, in the Middle Ages, they really didn't have that, well, in the Middle Ages in England, they didn't have that kind of um, sense of restraint that we have. You know, we have all these fake ideas about how really powerful people often dress quite modestly and that kind of thing. But yeah, in the Middle Ages at this time, you you dressed the best you could to show everyone what kind of person you were. Maybe, you know, you're a merchant's wife. That's awesome. Uh, and, you know, obviously the nobility took it way too far, as they always do. Um, so taking pride in your clothes was basically the same as taking pride in your social position um so there were okay from memory i cannot remember all the dates exactly but there have been sumptuary laws were introduced which would prohibit people of certain classes from wearing certain things and making sure that people of certain classes wore certain other things like in some towns sex workers had to wear striped hoods so you could identify them um or you know this class of people weren't allowed to wear velvet this class of people weren't allowed to wear silk this class wasn't allowed to wear this particular color that was you know very expensive to make so it was all to sort of stop people from um, running around trying to be better than they were, you know, trying to trick people <laughs> into thinking they were richer than they were. So she, it's not just vanity is my point that, um, that Marjorie's talking about with her dress here. It's not just vanity of her body. It's pride in her social position and her wealth, and which she shows off with her clothing. Um, God, I love the Middle Ages. Right, and when her husband used to try to speak to her, to urge her to leave her proud ways, she answered sharply and shortly and said she was come of worthy kindred. He should never have married her. For her father was sometime mayor of the town of N. Norwich, I think, from memory. And afterwards he was alderman of the High Guild of the Trinity in possibly Norwich. And therefore she would keep up the honour of her kindred, whatever anyone said. She was enormously envious of her neighbours if they were dressed as well as she was. Her whole desire was to be respected by people. She would not learn her lesson from a single chastening experience, nor be content with the worldly goods that God had sent her, as her husband was, but always craved more and more. So she's... And then... Out of pure covetousness and in order to maintain her pride, she took up brewing and was one of the greatest brewers in the town of probably Norwich. I'm just going to keep saying Norwich every time N comes up to the town. I might be wrong. I don't care. Uh, for three or four years until she lost a great deal of money, for she had never had any experience in that business. For however good her servants were and however knowledgeable in brewing, things would never go successfully for them. For when the ale had as fine a head of froth on it as anyone might see, suddenly the froth would go flat, and all the ale was lost in one brewing after another, so that her servants were ashamed and would not stay with her. Then this creature thought how God had punished her before, and she could not take heed. 
and now again by the loss of her goods. And then she left off and did no more brewing. Um, brewing ale, really good uh, income for women, especially like you know in the cities, which, yeah, yeah. Um, which is why we have the surnames Brewer and Brewster today. Brewster meaning a female brewer. It's like spinster means a female spinner. Although now it, you know, means someone who isn't married. Um, yeah, so she, she took up brewing. Marjorie Kim was an ambitious woman at this point. Um, she wants to dress above her station. Well, she wants to dress to what she thinks her station is. And she thinks her husband's isn't quite good enough. Um, and he he just kind of seems to go along with the things a lot. He's He kind of, he asks her to kind of rein it in when she's getting a little bit extra, as the children say. Um... And then she asked her husband's pardon because she would not follow his advice previously. And she said her pride and sin were the cause of all her punishing and that she would willingly put right all her wrongdoing. But yet she did not entirely give up the world for she now thought up a new enterprise for herself. She had a horse mill. She got herself two good horses and a man to grind people's corn and thus she was confident of making her living. Corn in this sense meaning fucking wheat and barley and things like that not maize you know this business venture did not last long for shortly afterwards on the eve of corpus christi the following marvel happened the man was in good health and his two horses were strong and in good condition and had drawn well in the mill previously but now when he took one of the horses and put him in the mill as he had done before this horse would not pull in the mill in spite of anything the man might do the man was sorry and tried everything he could think of to make his horse pull. Sometimes he led him by the head, sometimes he beat him, and sometimes he made a fuss of him. But nothing did any good, for the horse would rather go backwards than forwards. Then this man set a pair of sharp spurs on his heels and rode on the horse's back to make him pull, but it was no better. When this man saw it was no use, he put the horse back in his stable and ate, gave him food, and the horse ate well and freshly. Just lovely little details. I'm really happy for the horse. And afterwards, he took the other horse and put him in the mill. And just as his fellow had done, so did he, for he would not pull for anything the man might do. And then this man gave up his job and would not stay any longer with the said creature. I do have a couple of questions about that part, though. Um, so the horse isn't, you know pulling the fucking mill wheel to make the flour of the grain of the bread. And so you try to fuss over him and pat him. You try spurs, riding him around. You try beating him. You try, and then you try the second horse. I mean, okay. He wasn't to know the second horse wouldn't just work immediately. So she's got two failed businesses and uh, businesses under her belt at the moment. Then it was noised about in the town of Norwich that neither man nor beast would serve the said creature. And some said she was accursed. Some said God openly took vengeance on her. Some said one thing and some said another. And some wise men whose minds were more grounded in the love of our Lord said it was the high mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that called her from the pride and vanity of this wretched world. Maybe. And then this creature, seeing all these adversities coming on every side, thought they were the scourges of our Lord that would chastise her for her sin. Then she asked God for mercy, forsook her pride, her covetousness, and the desire that she had for worldly dignity, and did great bodily penance, and began to enter the way of everlasting life, as she'll be told hereafter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Marjorie Kent would have got super into... What is it? Lululemon? Is that the leggings one? That's also a pyramid scheme? 
I don't know. She wanted to, to run her own business from home. She was probably bored out of her mind. She seems to have been a very passionate person. And I imagine started all these businesses because there was something to do. Um, now we've got chapter three next. I have been reading for nearly an hour. Yeah, I think it's Lululemon. I think that is the one I'm thinking of. Um, oh, what's that makeup one? It's got really horrible bad makeup. I can't remember. Um, no, not Avon. It's like youth, youthy, longevity, youthiness. A woman had me trapped in her car and tried to sell me some. I said I had sensitive skin. I lied. But I didn't like it. Right, so I'm going to read chapter three. Because we are here. And, um, hmm, sorry. My hair looks like crap, but it's because I've been... <laughs> I have such a habit when I'm doing these live readings for you of just, like, running my hand through it when everyone's being stupid, so... Yeah, I'm not doing my hair nice for these <laughs> at the moment. Mary Kay? Mm, might, might have been. So, chapter three. One night, as this creature lay in bed with her husband, she heard a melodious sound so sweet and delectable that she thought she had been in paradise. And immediately she jumped out of bed and said, Alas, that ever I sinned, it is full merry in heaven. This melody was so sweet that it surpassed all the melody that might be heard in this world without any comparison. And it caused this creature, when she afterwards heard any mirth or melody, to shed very plentiful and abundant tears of high devotion, with great sobbings and sighings for the bliss of heaven, not fearing the shames and contempt of this wretched world. And ever after her being drawn towards God in this way, she kept in mind the joy and malady that there was in heaven, so much so that she could not very well restrain herself from speaking of it. For when she was in company with any people, she would often say, it is full merry in heaven. Could have been young living, yeah. Basically, Marjorie's in bed with her husband, she hears the beautiful music of heaven, and now every time people laugh or play music, she starts crying because it's not as good as heaven. Lula Rowe, that's the one, yes. Thank you, Alexander, that is good. It's bugging me. And those who knew of her behavior previously have now... And now heard her talk so much of the bliss of heaven, said to her, Why do you talk so of the joy that is in heaven? You don't know it, and you haven't been there any more than we have. And they were angry with her because she would not hear or talk of worldly things as they did, and as she did previously. And after this time, she never had any desire to have sexual intercourse with her husband. For paying the debt of matrimony was so abominable to her that she would rather, she thought, have eaten and drunk the ooze and muck in the gutter than consent to intercourse, except out of obedience. The debt of matrimony. That's romantic, isn't it? And so she said to her husband, I may not deny you my body, but all the love and affection of my heart is withdrawn from all earthly creatures and set on God alone. But he would have his will with her, and she obeyed with much weeping and sorrowing because she could not live in chastity. Yeah, she was like, well, you know, I guess we're going to keep having sex, but I'm not going to be into it. I don't love you anymore. I don't love anyone. It, it's all about Jesus. And he was like, yes, take what I can get. I'm sorry. Yeah, big yikes. I think you can interpret it either way, really. Um, Uh, is because of some other stuff in the in the story that I think that um okay I might <laughs> I might be a little bit um 
sort of based on nothing and probably insulting the memory of a long dead lady. But uh, I'm pretty sure that she wanted to be extremely holy, but was kind of still into her husband. And uh, it's like, well, I guess the laws of marriage say that I'm not allowed to say no. Um, that's the impression I get from it. I do not get a yikes impression, really. Uh, she bathed with much weeping and sorrowing because she could not live in chastity. And often this creature advised her husband to live chaste and said that they had often, she well knew, displeased God by their inordinate love and the great delight that each of them had in using the other's body. And now it would be a good thing if by mutual consent they punished and chastised themselves by abstaining from the lust of their bodies. So that's the bit that really makes me think, um, mm, yeah, I mean, I totally want to be chased uh, now, even though we used to bone constantly and we both loved it. I want to be chased, but you know, my husband, super into it, not much I can do. Um, that's why it's my interpretation. Her husband said it was good to do so, but he might not yet. He would do so when God willed. And so he used her as he had done before. He would not desist. And all the time she prayed to God that she might live chaste. And three or four years afterwards, when it pleased our Lord, her husband made a vow of chastity, as shall be written afterwards by Jesus' leave. So it doesn't sound to me like uh, marital rape. It sounds to me like kind of a get out of jail free card for get out of hell free card for Marjorie to be like mm, yeah, I mean, we still sleep together but uh, I'm not enjoying it I totally want to live in chastity and maybe after three or four years of her going oh chastity it sounds so amazing her husband was like fine have it there you go you got chastity have fun that's my interpretation uh and also, after this creature heard this heavenly malady, she did great bodily penance. She was sometimes shriven, uh, absolved of her sins, two or three times on the same day, especially of that sin which she had so long concealed and covered up, as is written at the beginning of this book. Oh, so she did get forgiven for that. That's nice. What was it, Marjorie? She gave herself up to much fasting and keeping of vigils. She rose at two or three of the clock and went to church and was there at her prayers till midday and also the whole afternoon. I mean, she's a stay-at-home mom. What's she supposed to do? She tried having a business. That didn't work. And then she was slandered and reproved by many people because she led so strict a life. She got herself a hair cloth from a kiln, the sort that malt is dried on, and put it inside her gown as discreetly and secretly as she could so that her husband should not notice it. Uh, hair cloth is a horrible material that people used to wear next to their skin that would um, it would cut and irritate the skin and uh, the cuts sometimes would get infected very painful to wear um, and a lot of people wore them under their clothes uh, I think Catherine of Aragon did so she was wearing this incredible you know silks and velvets and the best linen possible jewels like crazy and under all of that she was wearing a hair shirt which I don't know, it made sense to people at the time I think it sounds horrible personally um, and nor did he husband did not notice although she lay beside him every night in bed and wore the hair shirt every day and bore him children during that time really makes me wonder maybe she had it on the soles of her shoes like in that trailer for the movie Saint Maud which I really hope is as good as it looks then she had three years of great difficulty with temptations which she bore as meekly as she could thanking our Lord for all his gifts and she was as merry when she was reproved, scorned, or ridiculed for our Lord's love, and much more merry than she was before amongst the dignities of this world. 
for she knew very well that she had sinned greatly against God and that she deserved far more shame and sorrow than any man could cause her. And contempt in this world was the right way heavenwards, for Christ himself chose that way. All his apostles, martyrs, confessors and virgins, and all those who ever came to heaven passed by the way of tribulation, and she desired nothing as much as heaven. Then she was glad in her conscience when she believed that she was entering upon the way which would lead her to the place that she most desired. I mean, there seems to be a lot of, uh, I don't know, look, working out the, the pathologies of religion, that's not my thing. I do not understand it. But Marjorie's kind of helping me because she is so real. <laughs> She's such an absolutely real person that she kind of brings a whole mindset to life that is very alien to me. But I believe it because she is so real, you know. It's like how when you're doing a fantasy TV series, the more grounded in reality the background is, the more believable the story about the elves or whatever can be. Yeah, it's kind of like that, but much smarter because it's a university book. And this creature had contrition and great compunction with plentiful tears and much loud and violent sobbing for her sins and for her unkindness towards her maker. She reflected on her unkindness since her childhood, as our Lord would put it into her mind very many times. And then when she contemplated her own wickedness, she could only sorrow and weep and even and ever pray for mercy and forgiveness. Her weeping was so plentiful and so continual that many people thought that she could weep and leave off when she wanted. And therefore, many people said she was a false hypocrite and wept when in company for advantage and profit. And then very many people who loved her before, while she was in the world, abandoned her and would not know her. And all the while she thanked God for everything, desiring nothing but mercy and forgiveness of sin. So, that is the proem, prologue and first three chapters of the book of Marjorie Kemp. Um, I'm very sorry for the, the lighting quality and the sound quality. Um, I'll, I'll have that fixed soon, it'll be fine. Tomorrow's reading, I don't know if it will be at 2pm again. I will try to make it 2pm again. I'm going to try to try and get some regular hours going with these. Um, but thank you very much for joining me and getting a little glimpse into the mind of a very unique person, very interesting person. And um, yeah, it's been really fun, actually, hanging out with you all and, uh, and revisiting Marjorie Camp. I haven't read her book in a long time. And um, yeah, it's great. So thanks very much for joining me. It's been amazing. And I will see you tomorrow, I hope. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay, see you tomorrow. Bye.